In our first unit, we talked about kinematics, or we talked about motion. And motion is an important topic in physics, but it's not a particularly large topic, and it shows up all the time, but it's not used nearly as extensively as the next three topics. Perspective number two, forces, along with perspective number three, which is work and energy, and perspective number four, which is impulse and momentum, these next three topics are huge. Okay, so you really want to make sure that, you know, if there's anything that you understand, it's these three perspectives because they're massive in the world of physics. So in this video, we're going to basically lay out some uh, basic rules and definitions for our understanding of forces. If something is moving, there had to be a cause for that motion. We all know from daily life that if you have a dish sitting on the table, that the dish just doesn't start to move on its own. And so if it does start moving, something must have caused it to move. Also, if something is already moving and somehow the motion is changing, which basically means it's changing in speed or it's changing in direction, if either of these two scenarios is true, something must be causing it. So what is that something? Well, that something is force. And force explains why things move. Now, force can be defined very simple. Um, just like you would explain to your four-year-old brother or sister. And if you had to tell them, you know, what a force was, you would just say, hey, it's a push or pull. We have lots of different names for various forces. And most of those really are just a reiteration or renaming of one type of force. And I'm right now specifically referring to those forces that we... Uh, knowingly deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But if we take all the known forces in the universe, they boil down to one of four types of forces, and they call these fundamental forces. Now, there are four fundamental forces, and I'm going to list them in the order of increasing strength. So the first force is going to be the force of gravity. Gravity is a very weak force. It's the weakest of them all. Now, one piece of evidence that it's the weakest of them all is it takes something the size of a planet to create a small force on something the size of an apple. I mean, what's an apple weigh? A quarter pound? You know, three or four newtons? I mean, an apple really doesn't weigh much. And you have absolutely no difficulty in picking up an apple off the ground or out of the apple bin at the grocery store. So gravity is going to be the weakest, and we'll talk more about gravity when we get to it. The second type of force is the electromagnetic force. And it is by far the most common force that we knowingly interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. It explains friction. It explains um, why you feel things when you touch them. It explains why paint sticks to a wall. So virtually every force that we're going to be working with this year is going to be electromagnetic with a few exceptions. I mean, electromagnetic even covers magnets sticking to a refrigerator because that's a magnetic force. So virtually everything we do this year is going to be gravity or electromagnetic. The third force is the weak nuclear force. And you're not responsible for knowing the ins and the outs of these last two forces, the weak nuclear force. And then the fourth one is the strong nuclear force. Now, the weak nuclear force is responsible for some types of radioactive decay, and that's all you need to know about it. We're definitely not doing anything with it. And then the strong nuclear force, it's responsible for holding the nucleus together. And again, we don't need to know 
uh, anything more about these two forces. There's one more little detail I want to give you about the weak and strong nuclear force, and that is that these are very short range forces. So basically, once you get outside the region of the atom, the nucleus of the atom, the force becomes virtually zero, which is why we don't appear to interact with any nuclear forces on this macroscopic level. Now, before we can have a meaningful um, discussion or do anything meaningful with forces, we first have to understand what are the laws of motion. And there's a, just a tiny bit of history here related to the laws of motion. And we're going to begin with Galileo because Galileo really laid the foundation for Newton to... Um, describe the laws of motion in the way he did but uh, it really it all started with Galileo and that's also where in part the famous quote from Newton came from where he said that if I have seen further it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants and that's because he further developed what other scientists had done before him what Galileo did was basically he had three experiments or maybe I should say it's like two experiments. The first experiment that he did was just showing why objects which are in motion come to rest. Because up until that time, the prevailing theory was that, you know, certain objects want to be at rest. Or I should say most objects. And it seems pretty obvious. I mean, if you place a ball on the ground and you roll the ball, the ball comes to a stop. If you take your foot off the gas pedal while driving your car, the gar car comes to a stop. And so uh, he went on to prove that the reason that happened was because of friction. And so he did a series of experiments that showed that friction was the cause and that he was able to significantly reduce friction by using smooth, hard surfaces. So that would be like comparing and uh, a bowling ball with a tennis ball. Which one's going to stop rolling first? Well, it's going to be the tennis ball. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the, the weight of either one of those objects. Okay, now, the next uh, series of experiments that he did, or maybe they were just thought experiments, at least in part they were thought experiments, is um, where he went on to show that uh, objects have a tendency to want to keep doing what they're doing. And so it started off like this. In the first one, he just had a couple of ramps set up, and what he showed was that if we could eliminate friction and you place a ball up here, that the ball would roll down the ramp. And as it was rolling down the ramp, it would speed up and then it would roll up to the other side and it would slow down. And that the ball would return to its former height. Okay, so that was the first one. Then in the second experiment, he stretched this out a little bit and he put a flat section in the middle so it would curve down then a nice flat section then it would curve up and again what he saw was this if you place a ball up here the ball is going to speed up and then the ball is going to slow down it's going to come back to that same elevation it's not going to you know come to something lower or go even higher and that in this middle section the ball rolled with a constant speed. And so the third one was definitely a thought experiment. And it was just a flat ramp that curved, well, it was a ramp that curved down and went horizontal, but then it didn't go back up the other side. So the question is, if it speeds up on the way down, 
and it moves with a constant speed when it's on a horizontal surface, then where does it stop? Okay, and this is what led to the law of inertia. And basically what the law of inertia states is that an object in motion will remain in motion, or if an object is at rest, it will remain at rest unless it's acted on by a net force. Okay, so in here we have the constant velocity piece. There is zero net force on this middle section, on this horizontal section. On either ramp, whether it's going down the ramp or up the ramp, there is a force of gravity which is pulling down on the ball. And so what we conclude from this is that force causes motion and changes in motion. So let's formally get into Newton's laws. There are three of them. Newton's first law is the law of inertia. And the law of inertia can be expressed in three different ways. One that I already stated, and that was that objects in motion remain in motion. Objects at rest remain at rest. Unless acted on by a net force. Now, there's a couple things I want to emphasize here. And in particular is my use of the word net force instead of outside force. I do not like to use the term outside force because right now you have an outside force acting on you. You don't even really know what this means at this point in, in class. We'll talk about it a lot more to make sure it's perfectly clear. But you currently have an outside force acting on you. In fact, you have multiple outside forces acting on you. And if you're sitting in your chair and you're at rest, then you're going to remain at rest, even though you have this outside force acting on you. So it's not quite accurate to say an outside force. Now you might say a net outside force, but you cannot just say outside force all by itself. Okay, so that's the, our first way that we can express Newton's first law. The second way we could do it is we could just say quite simply that objects have a constant velocity. And because velocity is a vector, it carries with it the idea of speed and direction, right? So that means same speed, same direction. In other words, if the speed changes or the direction changes, then there must be a net force. And so we'll tack on to the end of this description here the same thing that we saw over here. Okay, so we have objects have a constant velocity unless acted on by a net force. Finally, we could also express the first law by saying that objects move with a constant speed in a straight line. Unless dot dot dot. Okay. So that's going to be the same as the first two ways we expressed it. All right. Now, if you wanted to express the first law mathematically, then all we would write is F net is equal to zero, or even F net equals MA, but we know that is the second law. All right. Now, Newton's second law, number two, is the law of acceleration. And... The law of acceleration in words basically states that force causes acceleration. And I need to put the qualifier on here. It's a net force which causes an acceleration. But in its most general terms, we would just say that force is going to be the cause of changes in motion. That's the law of acceleration, and we could write that as F net is equal to MA mathematically. Finally, we get to Newton's third law, and the third law is the law 
of action and reaction. And the law of action reaction conceptually just tells us that it takes two. You must have two objects interacting with each other in order for a force to exist. So, you know, if we look at planet Earth, planet Earth somewhere in the middle of outer space does not exhibit a force. But if you put something in that space, maybe it's an astronaut. Now the astronaut feels a force from the Earth, what we call gravity. Okay, if you give somebody a push, they push back on you. And so what we're saying is that it always takes two objects interacting with each other to create a force. If you don't have two objects interacting, then you do not have a force. You might have a field, but you don't have a force. And again, there's a lot of information here, and you know we'll be going over this in due time. Now, Newton's third law mathematically can be written like this. If we have two objects which have come into contact, and we'll say this is object A, and that's object B, then object B feels a force to the right, so this is going to be the force of A on B, the force due to object A on B, so A is going to be pushing to B to the right, and then in the other direction we're going to have the force of B on A. And so mathematically the way we write that is the force of A on B is equal to minus the force of B on A. So all we're saying is that the force must be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Now there is one caveat if Newton's laws are going to appear valid, and that is that we must be using what we call an inertial reference frame. If the frame of reference is not inertial or it's non-inertial, then Newton's laws appear to be invalid. So first, let's take a look at what a reference frame is. And if I were to define just what reference frame is, just this part right here. A reference frame is somewhere to make measurements from. So for example, um, you know, when you're walking across the room, you know, you're walking down a long hallway, you might look at a spot on the floor that's only 10 feet in front of you. You might look up and see that there's a person just off to your left coming in the other direction. And then you look ahead of you, straight ahead of you, and there's somebody that's just a few feet in front of you and you don't want to step on them. And so you use them as your reference frame. And so we're constantly shifting our focus from one object to another as we walk so that we don't walk into things or have an accident, like maybe falling down the steps because you didn't realize you were that close to the steps. Or you know, maybe walking into a pole which is supporting the ceiling somewhere in the middle of a dance floor. So, you know, the idea is a frame of reference, it's just somewhere to make measurements from. But specifically, what it means to be inertial means that it's not accelerating. Now, we know from our, our, our study in the last unit that acceleration means two things are going to happen. If it's accelerating, it's going to have a change in speed, so we want the speed to be constant. Or there's going to be a change in direction, so we want constant speed, constant direction. Now, uh, an example of an inertial reference frame would be the Earth is a great example. Um, if you're uh, on an airplane, okay, an airplane that's just in level flight, you've reached your cruising altitude, and there's nothing going on, we're, you're just moving in that straight line, then an airplane would be an inertial reference frame. Uh, an inertial reference frame, you know, like I said, it could be anything. It just can't be changing speed and it cannot be changing direction. An example where we might see 
an apparent contradiction to Newton's laws or where the frame of reference is non-inertial. And let me just write this down as a non-example. Um, suppose you're riding in an RV and you're stopped at a red light and you're sitting at the dinner table because uh, you can do that in an RV or at least many RVs, right? So you're stopped and you're sitting at a table and on that table you've placed a ball and that ball can roll very easily we'll say that it's like a, a field hockey ball it's hard and smooth the tabletop itself is hard and smooth and so friction is going to be a non-issue for us now what happens the light turns green and when the light turns green what do you see the ball do well, you see the ball begin to roll. Now, if the ball was rolling and it was at rest, you might erroneously conclude that the laws of motion are invalid because the ball just happened to start moving. Now, if that's the case, what you're doing is this. You're saying that the ball is located at position X right here on the table and that when you step on the gas, it suddenly accelerated in that direction because we'll say this is the forward direction up here. So forward is here. So the ball start and you're sitting here. Right? Okay, so you're sitting there and the ball starts rolling towards you. And so you catch the ball as it rolls off the table. So it goes from a position of x equals 0 to a position of, we'll just say, x equals uh, 1 meter. So clearly that's got to be a contradiction of the laws of motion, right? Wrong. What's happening is because the RV is accelerating, you go from zero to say 30 miles per hour, the RV is accelerating. The table is inside the RV, so the table and your surroundings are also accelerating. So by using your surroundings as a frame of reference, the ball appears to move on its own. But in reality, if you get outside the RV, and we have the ground down here, the ball is located at this position, I'll call x initial or x equals zero, and the RV at some time later has moved to this new position I'm going to draw in white. And it's going to be located uh, right about here at some point in time later and the ball is now located at the edge of the table here's the edge of the table and here's the ball it hasn't actually moved relative to this point in space on the ground so the RV has moved you have moved but the ball itself is still located right above that point on the ground so Newton's laws of motion actually are valid in this case because the RV is a non-inertial reference frame but the earth is inertial